quite a few years ago, Steve Jobs uh, came onto the stage and he held up something which nobody had ever seen before, which was basically a cell phone without buttons. And somebody asked him, what can it do? And he said, it can do pretty much anything, uh, basically saying there's an app for that. Uh, I feel at the moment, we're in the same world with drones. At the moment, if you want to do something, there's probably a drone that can help you do your job there. Uh, but let's go back and we'll start with drones. So what are drones? Uh, drones are really just robots that fly. They're aerial robots. They, they don't let things like gravity get in the way with what they're doing. Um, if somebody asks you what a drone looks like, you're probably going to describe something like this. It's got four propellers and a little camera sticking at the bottom. Um, this is another model that we like to use quite often. Also, again, four propellers, but they don't need to have four propellers. That model, as you can see, can fold away. Um, this is a much more advanced drone. We use this in the field quite often. It's called the DJI Matrice. Um, it's bigger, stronger, can fly through a lot more uh, difficult weather, and it can carry a number of different sensors, uh, cameras. And then this would be a fixed wing drone. Um, this is called an EB. I'll tell you a little bit more about it when we talk about the types of drones. Uh, to show you, the drones can look completely different. Uh, this is a solar-powered drone. Uh, you don't measure its flight time in hours or minutes. You measure its flight time in months. It can fly for about a year without landing. Uh, drones have had a bad name in the past. Previously, when somebody mentioned a drone, you, ex you thought of something that would go and bomb people hiding in the mountains somewhere. Uh, so we invented the terms UAV, Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, and Unmanned Aerial Systems, which is UAS. And those were the official terms for drones. But fortunately, what happened was a drone became something that you use for your wedding photos. And a technical term like UAS or UAV now means something different. Uh, the correct term to use is UAS, Unmanned Aerial System. Uh, but drones have come back into fashion, and we use them quite a lot. OK, a little bit of history. Uh, so in 1848, the, Aust the Austrians attacked Venice by launching balloons loaded with explosives. Uh, and that was the first unmanned aerial vehicle. It wasn't a great idea because um, basically the wind turned around and the drones also dropped some bombs onto Austria. In, 19, in 1898, uh, Nikola Tesla fooled the whole room in thinking that they could uh, control a, a boat by using their voices. He made them shout around the room. What he actually did was something much more impressive. He invented radio control technology and he was actually piloting the little boat around the room. Uh, we all know that the Wright brothers flew in the early 1900s, um, but just uh, 16 years later, somebody added uh, Nikola Tesla's technology into uh, an aircraft, and we had our first um, pilotless aircraft. Then in the 50s, uh, there was a breakthrough in transistor technology, and that meant that radio components became much, much cheaper and much smaller, and the, the radio control plane was born. And now I'm going to jump way into the, the early 2000s. Uh, Nintendo developed the Wii, which was a lot of fun if you didn't throw the control through your TV. Um, but what it had was it had a number of sensors, um, gyroscopes and uh, magnetic sensors. And what people started doing was they started disassembling these and building things that flew like this. So again, it was the, the model aircraft people that got together and used their skills to build aircraft that could hover. Uh, then we're moving on to the first commercially available drone. This one was built by Parrot. It's called the AR drone. Uh, the best feature of this drone was that you actually didn't need to build it. You could just open the box and fly. And finally, in 2013, the first DJI drone came out. Uh, this was the Phantom 1. You had to buy your own GoPro to stick underneath it. Uh, everybody was just blown away by how stable this drone was and uh, how the GPS worked and it could come back to you and you wouldn't lose it. And it was, at the time, groundbreaking technology, and it still is, which is why DJI now has over 70% market share. Okay, talking a little bit about types of drones. Uh, the most common types of drones are the multi-rotors. Now, multi-rotor drones can have any number of propellers. You could have four, six, eight, ten. There's no upper limit. Um, the benefits of a multi-rotor drone are you can take off vertically and you can land vertically. So it's very, very easy to fly. Um, the downsides of that is it uses a lot more energy. Now, if you've got four propellers, you also have a, a single point of failure. If one propeller breaks, your drone flips upside down and crashes. With uh, six propellers, you can lose one and land safely. 
Uh, with eight, you can in theory lose four propellers. As long as you lose the right four, uh, you end up with a sort of a very underpowered uh, quadcopter in that case, and you can carry on flying quite happily. Uh, this is a, a drone with a, the least number of propellers you can have, so the number is two. In this case, it's a helicopter and it's got a tail rotor. Now, you might think that the number of propellers are needed to lift heavier things, but in actual fact, the less props you've got, the more you can lift. Uh, propellers are not very efficient, and the less you've got with more power can do more lifting. So something like this Vapor 55, on a size-for-size -size basis, will lift, lift a lot more than a octocopter would of the same weight. All right, on to fixed-wing drones. Um, so this is the EBX. It's a fixed-wing drone. It's very, very efficient. A fixed-wing drone is probably about 10 to 20 times as efficient as a multi-rotor drone. Um, they're a lot harder to fly. Uh, you can't just um, tell it to take off and tell it to land. You've actually got to plan things quite, quite uh, significantly. Uh, for instance, with this one, you have to throw it into the air. And when it comes to landing, you've got to first tell it where you want to land and then also which flight path it needs to fly on into the landing. And uh, if you get it wrong, you fly into a tree, you lose your drone. Uh, if you overfly your landing, you end up in the water. It's a bit of a problem. Uh, this is another fixed wing drone. This one is based on a full aircraft. Um, it's called an Albatross. This one can fly 5,000 kilometers and carry 350 kilos. Uh, they actually call this a, a passenger optional. It can also carry a person if you wanted it to. Then we get onto my favorite type of drones. Um, we call them hybrid drones or VTOL. VTOL stands for vertical takeoff and landing. In theory, you get all the benefits of a multi-rotor drone. It can take off and land on the spot. And you also get the efficiency of a wing drone. Um, sometimes they operate with what's called a pusher prop. So in this case, the four props at the bottom will, can, will just do the lift. And once it's in the air, they'll turn off and the pusher prop will take over. Uh, to be more efficient, they've got rotating props. This one's got feathering props at the back. You can see how they fold flat. And the front one's aimed forward. Uh, this specific drone can actually fly for six hours on a single battery charge. And as I said earlier, there's no upper limit to the number of uh, propellers you can have. This one has got 36. Um, it's a passenger carrying drone. It can carry up to about five people and fly for 300 kilometers. That's called the Lillian Jet. Now we're going to jump into some drone uses. Um, we've got a whole lot of uh, different drone uses. Some we've used in the past and some we haven't. Uh, the first use of drones was for advocacy. Um, I'll start with this image. So we had a water shortage in Cape Town. I'm not sure if you all heard about it. Uh, we had a major shortage. All the dams were running dry and we were told to use less than 50 liters of water a day. And one of the tactics to get the people to actually use a lot less water was to show us drone imagery flying over the dams and that's the same dam in the previous picture. Um, the next key use is mapping. Um, when you do mapping with a drone, you fly a drone over a set route and you've got a camera aiming straight down and it takes pictures at regular intervals. Uh, the benefits of mapping with a drone, there's quite a few. The main one is in terms of the quality. So on the left, you can see what a Google satellite image would look. This is one of our offices in Madagascar. And on the right, you can see what it would look like uh, with a drone image. Now you can clearly see the lines are much better, um, but you can actually zoom in a lot more than that. So if you look at both pictures, you see a pile of rubble on the top. And with a drone, you can zoom right in and you can see there, they're storing a few motorbikes and a scooter and a few other objects there. Um, we did some mapping during the cyclone. So this was the WFP office taken from Google Earth before the cyclone. And that was the result of cyclone iodine. A digital elevation model. Now what this is, it's a, it's a very, very accurate uh, representation of what the altitudes look like. Uh, when you're mapping with drones, because you've got the same point in multiple photos, you can triangulate exactly where the points are, and you can use that to build up a very, very accurate, um, what we call an elevation model. Uh, 3D models. So the picture in front of you looks like a picture, but it's actually not. It's a 3D model. Um, if I want to zoom in on the trucks on the right, I can zoom in a little bit. We can zoom in a bit more. But the difference between a 3D model and an image comes from the fact that you can actually look at it from the side, so you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, in theory, you could plug this entire model into a 3D printer and you could print a, a model of what we're looking at. 
And then we get into some of the agricultural uses. Um, if you've got some agricultural people in the audience, they'll have heard of an NDVI image, Normalized Differential Vegetation Index. Uh, what this basically does is it adds an extra level of, uh, it adds an extra sensor to the camera. So the human eye can see in, in shades of blue, green, and red, uh, a lot like your computer monitor shows those same shades. When you use a camera that can pick up near-infrared light, uh, you can actually tell the difference between the amount of near-infrared light in an image. Uh, so if we look at a healthy leaf and you look at the blue, green, and red, you'll see it's virtually the same as a six leaves, blue, green, and red, but the near-infrared is very different. Now, a dead leaf is very easy to see. It's completely different to a healthy leaf, but the human eye actually can't see a sick leaf. Um, and what we found is using drones to do agricultural mapping or to look for the NDVI imagery, you can detect damage in a plant up to about 10 days before the actual damage is uh, visible to the human eye. And what that means is instead of uh, realizing by the time it's too late uh, that your crops are damaged, you can actually take some action and repair your crops. Uh, this is an NDVI image of a field. Uh, it's been used in Mozambique. Uh, they've analyzed about 3,000 fields of farmers and they've helped them allocate water more efficiently and uh, fertilizers a lot more efficiently. They're claiming to be saving the farmers about 40% of their inputs. And if you're in a world with a small amount of water, uh, that's obviously very valuable. Wi-Fi in the sky. Um, so if you've ever worked in an emergency, you've had to put up one of these towers really quickly to bounce the signal around the world. Um, the problem is you don't always have these towers available and you've got to fly them in on big aircraft. And drones are giving us an option there. So this drone uh, has a cable running down to the ground. So what the cable does is takes up a Wi-Fi signal, but it also takes up electricity. So the drone will basically fly 24 hours a day, 365 days a year and provide a very large area of Wi-Fi coverage. Uh, you can also use it to mount antennas which need to point in a specific direction. Uh, it can withstand the wind, it can withstand the rain. The next level up from that is a flying car. Uh, so previously in emergencies, we roll out radio networks all over the city. It means uh, climbing into a lot of roofs and putting up a lot of towers. But what's been developed now is basically a drone-based cell phone tower. Again, it's got a cable running up, it flies 24 hours a day, but instead of uh, sending out Wi-Fi coverage, this covers the area in a Wi-Fi network. And potentially for future emergencies, we could be using these to cover a city in connectivity. We wouldn't need to roll out uh, radio networks. We could just have a text-based communication and we could roll it out for, for the entire city. Uh, crop spraying, obviously a very useful tool. Uh, what they found is that uh, the amount of time to spray sorry, the amount of crops a human can spray by hand in eight hours can be done by a drone in about two minutes. Um, you've lowered the risk. You don't need to use aircraft to reach difficult to reach places. And the pesticides go exactly where you need them to do, to go. You can reach the top of plants. You can cover sort of full areas rather than standing on the side and trying to spray. Uh, they're also using these in China at the moment uh, to do disinfectant spraying for COVID-19. Uh, security. So when most people think of the military using drones, they think of drones carrying bombs. But actually the most common use is for drones accompanying troops. Uh, what they would do is they would keep the drone a few kilometers ahead of the troops and they'd be able to see what's coming up in the road and take action before they're actually in harm's way. Uh, we've done a lot of work combining drones with AI and WFP. Uh, we've got an AI drone specialist. Uh, initially when we did the maps of Beirut City, we tried to mark out which houses have been damaged, which houses have lost their roofs, and which houses are unaffected. Uh, the trouble is there were 60,000 houses in Beira, so we obviously couldn't do it by hand. Um, so our AI specialist came up with an idea, and he said, okay, well, let's first see if we can detect houses. And so we took uh, a few hundred houses and we trained the algorithm to detect what a house is, and we got to about 92% accuracy, and the drone would be able to identify the houses for us. Um, and then we moved on and said, okay, well, these houses don't have roofs. Can you tell the difference? And again, we trained the drone with many, many images. Sorry, not the drone. We trained the AI algorithm with many images. And after some time, it was able to tell us exactly how many houses had lost their roofs and how many hadn't. And we could use that to say that in a specific area, 60% of the houses were damaged. Or we could say that uh, we need a X number of square meters of tarp to provide shelter for people again. 
um, it became very, very useful. Very useful for getting data very quickly. Okay, on to food aid delivery. I know we're going to hear a lot more about cargo delivery later on. Um, but uh, WFP is looking into this. I'm sure a number of other people are looking into this. Uh, this drone here is actually designed by Boeing. It can lift uh, 500 pounds, uh, which is about 225 kilos. Uh, but to be honest, you don't need to lift such a heavy weight to be able to do a food delivery. Uh, one of the earlier innovations WP was looking at is how we can deliver a box of high energy biscuits. And a very small drone can actually deliver a box of high energy biscuits. Um, they've designed the box so it doesn't actually need a parachute. It pops open and spirals down like a seed. Um, now, there's two ways to scale food delivery. You can either scale it by making a bigger drone. The problem is things become a lot more complex kind of exponentially when the drones become bigger. Or you can simply buy more drones and you can have drones going in all directions and coming back, swapping the batteries and they can carry on going. Uh, edible drones, I won't touch on this too much, but basically somebody decided that uh, we don't want our drones to get shot down while they're delivering food. So they made a drone that's disposable, uh, it carries foodstuffs in it and it's made of a uh, wood and cellulose material. So you actually burn the body of the drone. No motor, you fire it from a cannon or launch it from a plane. And uh, when it lands, you break it up and you, you use the body as firewood. Uh, drones for reforestation. Uh, this is a picture of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Haiti on the left has been deforested, the Dominican Republic hasn't. Um, so at the moment, we are cutting down 10 billion more trees every year than we plant. And uh, we can't plant fast enough, so we're going to bring in the drones. There's about four companies working on this technology. Um, and they all work in pretty much the same way. If you think about it as a paintball gun carrying a germinated seed, it flies along and it fires these seeds into the ground. Um, different companies are quoting different performance figures. Some say they can plant 45 times faster than a person. The others say they can plant a seed every second. And cargo delivery, I know we'd all like to, <clears throat> sorry. We'd all like to receive our Amazon parcels a lot faster, <clears throat> but drones are actually already delivering cargo. <clears throat> oh, give me one second. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so drones are already delivering life-saving cargo in a country in Africa, and that country is Rwanda, where the company is called Zipline. Now, Zipline has already delivered 24,000 units of blood without issue. They deliver blood up to an 80 kilometer radius. Uh, Rwanda is the country of a thousand hills. Now, some of these uh, clinics in, uh, in the distant areas would take about five hours by road to reach. And the longest drone flight you would need is about 45 minutes. Now, some of the stats tell me that 95% of uh, roads in Africa wash out annually. Um, so it is potential that Africa could leapfrog roads and go straight to drone delivery, just like they leapfrogged uh, fixed line phones and went to mobile. Uh, the zipline drones are great. They, they are fixed wing drones. They launch off the catapult, you can see in the picture. They drop the blood from a little parachute. Um, the aim is pretty good. They can land to within about two parking spaces and the drone comes back and gets caught on its way back home. Life-saving drones. Uh, this is an Australian drone. It's called the, the little ripper or the mini ripper. Um, it flies up and down the coastline every day and it carries a life preserver, which is actually not visible in the picture. It's, uh, it's been used to save lives. Um, when it finds people in trouble, if, especially if they're far away from the lifeguard station, it will drop the preserver. And people will run down the beach to go and help. Its main task, though, isn't actually to save lives. Its main task is to spot um, sharks in the water. So they, they've put people behind the screen, but they've also got some AI programmed into it. And they found that the AI can detect 90% of sharks, and humans can only detect 30% of sharks. Um, Moving on, uh, drones for search and rescue. This was again something we used in, uh, in IDA. I'll tell you a little bit more later. If you, at the moment we have to do search and rescue using helicopters. Now you need, if you're using your helicopters for searching, you obviously don't have enough available to do the rescuing as well. And our theory is, is that in future drones will be doing the search phase of the search and rescue. And we will use the helicopters purely for the rescue phase. Uh, people carriers. So this could potentially be your taxi in future. Um, battery technology is on the cusp of making this work. I, I expect it to be an order of magnitude cheaper to fly a drone than it would be to fly a helicopter. 
it's also going to be much safer and much simpler. They'll be flying automated. Um, this drone has got eight moving parts, eight propellers, and the ability to carry a parachute. With the helicopter, you can't do that. Uh, with a helicopter, you also have 10,000 moving parts, and if any of them fail, you're in big trouble. Uh, we might not see it as a taxi, but I do see it potentially as an emergency vehicle in future. Um, as the roads become more and more clogged, if you have an accident on the roads, you know, potentially you could send a paramedic on a motorcycle, but if you needed to evacuate somebody quickly, you wouldn't be able to do that uh, in a vehicle, uh, whereas you could call for an unmanned drone and put the passenger into it and send them to be evacuated. Uh, drones can fight malaria, dengue fever, and Zika virus. Um, they do this by releasing sterilized uh, either mosquitoes or tsetse flies. Um, this has been done in Brazil, and we're working on another project in uh, Ethiopia, which works in the same way. And the idea is that you've got a drone with a bit of a hopper, and it releases the mosquitoes sort of in, at regular intervals or where the, where the breeding locations are. Uh, they used to do this by plane. The problem is the uh, planes are very expensive to fly and uh, the insects often escape and start attacking the pilots. Um, okay, warehouse stock management. Um, basically, instead of uh, needing to go and read barcodes from a, a high lift, you can go and send a drone through your warehouse. Uh, even better than barcodes is QR codes. Uh, MIT developed this, which basically repeats a QR code signal to a reader. Uh, the benefit of that is that uh, as you're moving through the warehouse, you can detect QR codes at the same QR code at various times and you can triangulate the, the location of an object. And they found they can locate something in the warehouse within about a 15 centimeter radius, which is pretty good. And then demining. Uh, at the moment, every type of demining requires something to be on the ground. Uh, hopefully it's a big, strong mining vehicle which can handle an explosion. Uh, but often uh, the most efficient has, up to now has been a human carrying a metal detector. But to take the, the human out of the danger situation, uh, they've worked on a drone-based solution. So the drone would first fly the field and map it out completely. Uh, then it would follow the map and it would dangle a metal detector below it. And it would mark the locations of every mine detected. And a third, uh, it's the same drone. A third arm for the drone would go and pick up uh, detonating devices and plant them next to every, every mine detected and detonate. And in that way, you would basically be able to demine a field with, with virtually no risk involved at all. 